All right, I'm gonna stop our timer before it makes a dreadful noise. Um, I'm just, um, we're gonna go ahead and get started, everybody. Um, it's two o'clock and, um, and we are, just so you know, recording this um, on both Zoom and it's live streaming on Facebook and we'll record those and post it later. Um, welcome to Dreambox for Parents. Um, if you found the live Facebook event, you did better than I did. A couple nights ago, I was trying to find the kindergarten parent one and it took me a long time. Facebook has changed. Um, I'm Sarah Langton. Um, I worked at Raleigh Hills teaching sixth graders math and science for a really long time. Um, now I'm part of the teaching and learning team. I'm a Matosa, that's teacher on special assignment, and I, I mostly do digital curriculum. And I'm a big part of the adaptive math uh, programs that we have for students um, in the district. Um, but I have invited a fantastic team today um, to help uh, both present and answer questions on the chat. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves now. Hi, I'm Rebecca Carney. I'm there in the middle and have the pleasure of supporting math at the elementary level. Hi, I'm Anna Gustavison. I will be on the chat today answering some of your questions. Um, I'm also on the elementary math team. Hi, I'm Carrie Forsell. I'm also on the elementary math team and I'll be answering questions as well. Hi, I'm Paul Autumn. I'm on the right there on the screen. I'm the director of Flex, our online program. And so I support all things online, including the adaptive math programs. Thanks, guys. Um, so if you do have questions during the webinar, uh, add them to the chat on either Zoom or Facebook. Um, the team will answer them as, as fast as they can. Um, they'll put both the question and the answer back, um, back into um, the whatever chat feature you entered your question in. We're also going to save these questions um, and add them to an FAQ page. Um, so frequently asked questions that you'll be able to access after the webinar. Um, we'll also make this presentation that I'm going to go through um, with you for about the next 30, 40 minutes um, available as well. Um, so all of that will be available on the district web page. Uh, before we get started, though, um, if you want to maybe add to the chat window, whichever one you're using, um, what grade your child or children are in in the district, what school, um, and then if you'd like, you can rate kind of how comfortable you are with Dreambox um, from one to five. So one being not very comfortable at all, um, logging in can be a challenge all the way up to um, five being really comfortable. And I promise if there are fives out there, I won't promote you to co-host and make you leave the presentation. <laughs> So I'll go ahead and give you a chance to tell us about um, what grade and, and where do your children go to school. Cooper Mountain, Springville, Shows Heights, Conestoga, awesome. Yep, all kids K-8 have access. Fantastic. All right. Well, our agenda um, for today um, is talking a little bit about um, why, why are we using Dreambox? Um, what is it? Um, and, and a little bit about how it might be different um, than other um, math programs that you might be used to, um, how to use it, um, and then some tips for success because we're kind of all in this uncharted territory where all of a sudden you're a homeschool teacher. Um, so we'll kind of talk about that and then there'll be some time at the, at the end for um, any questions that didn't get answered in the chat or things that have gotten brought up that you want specific answers to. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca, who's going to talk about the sort of the whys behind um, Dreambox. Right. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to give you just a little bit of background of how we arrived at Dreambox as one component of our elementary Beaverton School District program. Uh, we go through a pretty rigorous process every time we are looking at adopting new materials. 
And that includes looking into the research um, and specifically what our students need. So through that process, uh, we, it led us to some of these bullets you're seeing here around kind of what are the skills in demand? What are we learning about number sense and the best way to support that? And what do we know about productive struggle? So starting with the in-demand skills, what you see here on the left is the Fortune 500 most valued skills in 1970. And you'll see those ranked starting with writing at the top. And you'll see that we're highlighting where computational skills lands back in 1970 as number two most valued. Where, and you'll see problem solving all the way down as number 12. And then it, the right hand side is about 30 years later and a exact um, flip flop of what is most valued by our Fortune 500 companies. Um, there have been more recent reports since 1999 that now have problem solving at the top. So perhaps in your own life, your own um, jobs over years, that you may have had experience where problem solving and teamwork and those kinds of things have become more valued. Whereas we've got Siri now that can do a lot of that computational skills. So you can um, maybe imagine how that change has happened over time. And then the next thing that we looked at, especially being elementary and the importance of developing number sense with some data around the best way to do that. And from one study of 13 million students, and this is worldwide, so really looking at the different techniques that different places use for the teaching and learning of number sense, we find that the lowest scoring students are those who use memorization strategies. And that might be the way a lot of us learned, um, but as we can expand now looking across the world, um, we can really see that it's actually the highest scoring students, the ones that didn't just do the memorization piece, but actually looked at and thought about the big ideas in math and the connections between them. And that's what we're wanting for our students to know more than just the procedures, um, but actually to know how and why things work and really emphasize that we want our students to make sense of math. You may be one of those adults out there. It's a very large percentage of people that really, even though they may have done some memorizing, they still wouldn't consider themselves very comfortable with math. And that's a, a huge reason that we need our students as they're coming up into this problem solving world to really be making sense of and seeing themselves as mathematicians. And then finally, is this idea of productive struggle. And Sarah's gonna flip the slide, there it is. Um, this is a great um, topic that we're excited about because what research is showing everywhere, not just in math, um, is this importance of struggling and how critical that is to master anything. So looking at the highest achieving people in the world, they have been through struggle um, in order to get to a deeper understanding. There's research in the neuroscience field that has studied the brain and actually seen that when we are as learners making mistakes, we are seeing um, an increase in brain growth and connectivity. And the conclusions from all of this research is that if we are not struggling, we're not really learning. And again, we're talking about that depth of, of learning. So if you have looked over the shoulder of your student while they're doing Dreambox um, and or yourself, per perhaps you've experienced some of this productive struggle. And that is very intentional in Dreambox and very much a part of the math philosophy in, in general in the school district. So again, Dreambox isn't the only piece that provides this, although it is fantastic at it and aligns beautifully and remember just one part of a larger curriculum that we hope your students get to experience, especially when they're back in classrooms where we have hands-on inquiry-based curriculum where students are collaborating and really digging into the big ideas 
having some productive struggle and building the conceptual understanding, of course, still leading to all of those procedures and number sense that we know um, we need out there in the world. So awesome. if you have more questions related to any of that, please put that in the chat and we will get back to you on any of that. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, so uh, Rebecca tackled sort of the why um, behind Dreambox. And, and so now like, what is it? Um, was adopted by the school board K-5, which just means that a team of people looked at a lot of different uh, programs and presented them uh, the, the school board with which one they wanted um, and the school board agreed. Um, and the adaptive piece is one that I think makes Dreambox sort of unique. Um, so basically that means that when your child first logs into Dreambox, um, Dreambox looks at their grade level and starts showing them lessons and collecting data immediately. Dreambox collects 800 pieces of data for every minute that your child is doing lessons in Dreambox. Um, every click gives information about what a student understands. So every time they drag something, where they pause, what they try, what the answer is. Um, so if you think about um, your Netflix or Amazon Prime, or as kids would tell me earlier um, this year, um, or Disney Plus, um, that account collects data about you as a user um, based on what trailers you watch, what you add to your um, watch list, um, and then uses that information to recommend other shows for you. So Dreambox is doing the same thing, but they're going to use the information they collect about your child um, when they're doing lessons and use it to then know what is your child ready for next. So the lesson itself adapts while your child is in the lesson. It also uses data to adapt to the lessons that are, the other lessons that are available to your child on the dashboard, as well as even adapting some of the other lessons that haven't yet been shown to your child or that your child is midway through um, and hasn't finished. So. There's a lot of um, pieces of information and it's all research-based on helping to uh, personalize and individualize the experience in Dreambox. Um, so uh, the next bullet is about that it's um, engaging and it's concept-based. Um, basically that means that Dreambox attaches situations to the numbers. So I don't know about you, but when I was in math, the textbooks and the worksheets had um, you know, a full page of just plain old numbers that and calculations. So I was adding one eighth plus three fourths, and then I was adding one eighth plus two thirds. And but I didn't know what the fractions were for. Um, and so now we we know about learning in the brain is that it is better to attach some sort of meaning to those numbers. So Dreambox. Um, the students are interacting with tools or shapes or clocks. Um, they're cutting logs. They're using a ruler. All. Um, to sort of demonstrate that they understand what the numbers are, are doing, relationships and patterns and things like that. Um, so as Dreambox is, um, it's also, I should say, available. Every child who is in K-8 right now has access to Dreambox um, and they will have it all summer long as well. Um, so as Dreambox is um, collecting this data, um, this next video clip that I'm going to show is, is sort of um, watching the behind the scenes of Dreambox. Um, it's a map that shows sort of the, the mathematical concepts in kindergarten through eighth grade. Um, and there will be purple dots and red dots to sort of represent the two students um, as they progress through. Those two students are in the same grade. Um, so as you can see, now, as you can see, um, this student is progressing through concepts and skills lessons in Dreambox. The purple one student um, is progressing a little bit faster, but I also want you to recognize that students are moving side to side into different concepts. They're also moving backwards. So just because a student demonstrates once that they understand something doesn't mean that they never see that again. Um, it's really typical for a student in Dreambox to be working on several grade level standards at one time. Um, so Dreambox does not hold a child to completing every concept in a grade level before they move them on. So for instance, I'm gonna 
stop this. Um, for instance, um, if, if your child is a second grader um, and they have a really good number sense, but measurement and data is trickier for them, they can progress past second grade skills in the number sense area of math while they're still working on um, gaining strength in the measurement and data. So it's really typical when a teacher would look at, at what standards a student has mastered to see that a student is working on first, second, third, and fourth grade um, tasks or targets. Um, and the teacher gets a really organized dashboard um, for their whole class and for each student. So the teacher isn't looking at the, the video similar to this screen. Um, they see the data organized by um, lesson completion, standards students are progressing in, standards that students have mastered, growth over time. Um, and, and that's really powerful um, for teachers. Um, they can use that data to individualize some of their um, instruction. And I, and I recognize that sort of right now, like that's really, that's tricky for teachers. Um, we're all sort of in this uncharted territory, um, but in days of school in person, <laughs> um, many teachers use this to target specific standards or to pull small groups. Um, coming in the fall, um, schools will be able to see students who have completed regularly completed Dreambox lessons. They will be able to measure those students on the sort of the benchmark of whether they're they're going to meet those um, state testing regulations for passing. Um, so, in that way, the data becomes even more powerful for for teachers. Um, and one of the other reasons why we really want to see students using Dreambox regularly. Um, just real quick um, on how you get into Dreambox. Um, depending on the device you're using, there are a couple ways to get logged in. So if your child is a third grader or older and using a Chromebook or a computer, they should be logging in just like they do at school. Um, so using their um, BSD email and password um, through the student apps page. Um, and if you don't know what the password is or what your username is, that would be something you'd contact your, your student's teacher about. In most of our schools, kindergarten through second graders use iPads to do Dreambox while they're at school. Um, and so if you are not using an iPad at home, um, that might be a little bit trickier because you can't just rely on your student to, to know how to log in. Um, so at the end of this presentation, there is a couple support documents linked that would walk you through how to get logged in. Um, and if for some reason you don't have one of the things that you need, that would be um, a reach out to your child's teacher um, and they can provide that or help you with, with getting that. Um, right now, Dreambox is not supported on an Android device um, or phones because phones are just too small. Um, so get, students need a Chromebook or a computer or an iPad to be able to access it. Um, so now I wanna, um, I want to do a little bit of a walkthrough of what the learning environment looks like in K2 and in 3.5. Um, so when I say learning environment, just know that um, that doesn't impact the type of math that your, your child is exposed to. Um, so if you think about um, some of our struggling readers who are maybe in some of the older grades don't really want to be carrying around a, an I Can Read book. Bob and Sue met. Um, and Dreambox has figured out a way for um, the interface to match maybe more the child's development level or maturity, um, whereas the math can be whatever math the child needs. So a student can be in the K2 environment doing math lessons at third grade or higher if they've shown mastery. Um, and a student can also be in the third through fifth grade environment working on math below the third grade level. Um, so I'm gonna go live to um, the um, one of the um, students who's using Dreambox and just kind of point out a few things. And I apologize, I'm not able to turn off her voice and then see. It's great to have you back in the Dreambox neighborhood. Have fun on your learning adventures. Uh, so one of the things to know is that these two sections up here, the top two circles, are the My House and My Arcade. 
Um, and so those are areas where students can see their earned rewards, they can play some math games that they've earned, but that's not where the lessons are located. Um, so the lessons are located in these bottom four. And for the most part, no matter which area that your child chooses, the lessons will be similar or exactly the same. The, the thing that changes for the K2 environment is there's kind of quite a bit of storyline. Um, so they might be looking for fossils if they choose the dinosaur one. Um, in the pirate one, um, they're trying to save whales from traps and things like that. So um, just so that you can sort of see. Um, All right. Welcome, have fun exploring, matey. Um, so at this point, the storyline kind of keeps going. Help Barnacle Beard find his missing pirate, Smelly Magoo, and his lost treasure. Arr, that's the spirit. Bovast, you're just in time to catch some fish with the crew. Captain, Captain, I've caught something. What is it? A bottlefish? Let me see that, lad. It's not a fish at all. Hmm, seems to be a message in a bottle. Seems like maybe I chose the wrong one. Sure, timbers, I can't believe it. It's a note from our long lost shipmate. Some of the storylines are longer than others. He disappeared years ago after we had him hide some treasure of ours. Oh, I remember him. What does it say? It says he buried the treasure on Crossbone Island. We're going to try a different one and see whether we can get to some math so that I. I can show you what I'm trying to show you. All right. Let's go finish finding Sprite Blossoms for the Lantern Festival. Perfect. Okay. Click the games along the path to play them. So the backpack shows up because that's an earned reward. Um, and that gives them another piece of the storyline. I'm not going to click on it because I don't want the student to then not have the opportunity to click on it. But one of the things I wanted to point out are the colored circles around the lessons. Um, so the green circles are around lessons that your child has already demonstrated understanding of. They've played them and demonstrated understanding the lesson is completed. Um, if you're concerned that your child is only choosing those green lessons, don't worry. Um, sometimes kids gravitate toward what's comfortable and familiar. They understand how to do it. That's totally fine. Those will eventually go away. Um, the yellow ones are the ones that are the just right lessons. So those are ones where they Dreambox knows they have shown they know enough um, to be able to complete those lessons. Um, sometimes there are also orange circles. The orange circles are the ones that are just harder than the yellow ones. So I would encourage your child to choose the yellow ones. And sometimes teachers have had success in saying, if you need help, click the help button. She doesn't like that I'm not playing a game. Um, choose the yellow ones because they're the same same color as the coins that you want to earn. Um, so another thing to note, to note um, is that um, Dreambox is about completing lessons and not necessarily time in the system. Um, and so you can see in the K2 environment where your child has done the lessons by looking at looking on their avatar, which is at the bottom, um, sorry, at the top left side of the screen. Um, so during normal times, um, teachers were usually encouraging students to complete somewhere between five and 10 lessons um, every week. So um, we know these are not normal times. Um, so we do what we can. Um, just so you know that that lesson counter starts over um, uh, Sunday morning. So midnight between Saturday and Sunday. So when your child wakes up on Sunday, the lesson counter has started over. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and, um, and share how um, I would get into the three five. Give me just a second because I have to pop out of that student's account. My computer's catching up. Okay. Um, it would also be um, important for me to, to... It's great to have you back in the Dreambox neighborhood. Have fun on your learning adventures. Oh. 
looks like the students got changed. So there must have been something that happened between last night and today. Um, well, <laughs> I do want to show you the three five. Um, but um, when a when a student reaches third grade, they are automatically changed over. So if you have a third or a fourth grader, or even a second grader who is ready to be out of the storyline part and um, the adventure park um, of the dream box environment, um, those things can be changed by the teacher. Um, so when a student completes a certain amount of math, they're sort of automatically changed over by Dreambox. Um, but if you feel like your child might be ready for that next level, that would be something where I would just communicate that with the teacher. Um, so I'm gonna pause this again. We'll see whether or not I can find <laughs> somebody. Um, so this is the 3-5 environment, um, and you'll notice it looks quite a bit different. There are no storylines. It's just right to the lessons. Um, the, the house and the arcade that were part of the K-2 environment now, um, some of those same aspects of the, the system can be found under my stuff. Um, so this is where students can spend money that they've earned by doing the math on background music, wallpaper, avatars, they can also play games in the collections section. Those are games they've earned by doing the math. Um, and then the badges is kind of a cool section where um, built-in dream boxes. That has happened because the student earned a badge since the last time she logged in. Um, so this is where students are, um, there's motivation or celebration of the accomplishments. And I think one of the coolest badges um, I don't remember the name of it, but it has something to do with it was hard and you persevered. Um, so um, if we go back to lessons, uh, the, the spot where you would see how many lessons your child has done this week is going to be found instead over here in these three lines. Um, so I just pop that out and I can see um, that how many lessons for this week and it's the same in the K2 and the 3-5 environment. Everything starts over on Sunday morning. Uh, so um, there are no green and yellow and orange circles in the lessons for the 3-5 environment. Um, uh, later, I'm going to talk about um, when you leave. And so I'm going to leave in the, in the correct way up here and just quit and then confirm that yes, I do want to quit. Um, so, um, as you're at home um, and now sort of in the role of teacher um, and, and your child might have been doing Dreambox at home before this, um, but now we hope they are definitely doing Dreambox at home and you're sort of in the role of like, do I help or not? Um, and so we have a few kind of tips about um, sort of watching from the side. So I'm gonna um, play this short clip. What is a guaranteed way to ruin it when you're teaching? And the answer is telling too soon. And so I'm gonna prove this to you. Uh, so a very typical model of instruction is sort of tell in practice. The students are told what to do or think, and then you, you know, they might get a lecture or worked example or written instructions. So they get that first, right? And then afterwards, you give them a bunch of problems to solve based on what you just told them. Sound familiar? Sound like college? Yeah, yeah. So the, the problem with this is that uh, students focus on what they were told. They're paying attention to what you just told them. They're not paying attention to the situation. So they're not gonna see anything new because they're so busy trying to copy what you told them. And so telling people can overshadow your, their perceptions. A good example of this uh, is there's this great study where there's this toy that has like four functions to it. And if the parent shows one of the functions to the toy of the toy and then gives it to the kid, the kid only does that. If the parent shows nothing and gives it to the kid, the kid finds all four functions of the toy, right? So they, they believe that what we're being told is everything they need to know and they just pay attention to that. Um, so um, as, a, as a parent myself, um, I, I think I have a lot of empathy um, because I have recently put my own child um, 
Cruise 5 onto Dreambox this year. Um, and because Dreambox is constantly collecting data of what your child knows, um, I know um, that it's really important for me not to help with the math. Um, and my daughter loved it at first, um, would beg to use the computer and do, can I do Dreambox today? Um, and now we're at a point where we're saying, I hate this. I'm never doing it again. <laughs> um, my instinct as a parent is to want to jump in and, and save her and make it better, which in this case sort of therefore makes it easier. Um, and so I feel you if, if you're having some of those moments at home. Um, and just to sort of give you some permission um, um, and, and know that if, if those are some of the feelings that that that's kind of a muscle that we're wanting kids to develop, that persevere when things get tough. Um, and we all have different parenting strategies and techniques. And so you'd sort of have to know your kid and Carrie is gonna share an example because she also has um, a child who does dream box at home. Um, Carrie, do you wanna jump in and um, share your, your side? <laughs> sure, um, I have a child who wants to do everything right the first time and doesn't want to get things wrong. And, um, and so it's very hard for her sometimes when dream box does get hard, um, there's tears. Um, but then we kind of talk through just to pick something, just whatever you think. And if she continues to do that a couple times, then dream box learns, Oh, this is too hard. I'm going to give her something else. And so it's almost like it does get to a point of frustration. And that's when you're going to ask kids to make mistakes, that mistakes are good because then Dreambox learns from them and then they don't feel like they can't make mistakes. So we're, it's actually helping her know it's okay not to be right the first time. Yes. Um, and um, I, I was unfamiliar with um, thank you, Carrie. That was unfamiliar with some of the lessons in the um, in the three five environment, but I I wanted to click on one just to sort of show you. Even um, my job is to support Dreambox, and I get to lessons, and I I don't know what to click. And the things that I instinctively think, oh, I would just do this, that doesn't work. Um, and so I think helping kids understand that you can't break it, um, and clicking on things and trying things is okay. Um, I think if you if you take away from this session that really what we we would want is to be your child's cheerleader more than anything. Um, if if you can create a habit of giving high fives for things like brain sweat when your kid is just feeling like oh my gosh like <laughs> it must be sweating in there I'm working so hard um, and or when they want to stop because it is hard and, but they keep going. Um, those are muscles that kids need need to practice and develop. Um, and wrong answers are also worth acknowledgement. Um, Dreambox gets more attuned to your child um, the, with, with every answer, whether they be wrong or right, the system gets smarter. Um, part of my job under normal circumstances is to go in and talk to teachers and students. And one of the stories that I often tell kids is that when my oldest was two and a half, um, we took her to one of those free Saturday Home Depot workshop things. We were gonna build a, a birdhouse. Um, and in my mind, when I pictured this thing happening, um, she was given some sort of child size hammer, but we show up and she gets like a legit hammer. Um, and I'm realizing as we're going to sit down, like I am going to have to hold these nails and the kids all laugh and that's funny. And, um, but I told them that Dreambox is, is literally the best hammer ever created. If you think about Dreambox as a tool, um, the more times I hit my thumb with the actual hammer or that my daughter hit my thumb, that hammer isn't changing. Um, but the more things that you get wrong or struggle in Dreambox, Dreambox is going to adapt um, and become a better, more attuned, individualized um, tool for your child. Um, when your child is using the tools provided, the help button, trying hard, still getting questions wrong, that just helps the system know exactly what they need more of. Um, so as parents, we kind of have to let them hit their thumb, even if it's hard on us <laughs> to watch, um, it will be better for them in the long run. Um, so allowing for that pr productive struggle. Um, if you do have to step in, um, we, we understand that that's going to happen, but maybe asking questions that don't have to do with solving the math for them or giving them hints, um, as Daniel said in the video, um, if we show them 
a way to do it, they're going to think that's the way. That is the only way to do it. And so we want them to enter into Dreambox with a problem solving, try to figure it out mindset. Um, also, you are the expert on your child. No one knows your child better than you. And if it's time to take a break, take a break. Um, per, you permission granted. Um, so when there's tears at my house, um, we walk away from the Chromebook and we play a game. Um, sometimes it's a math game, sometimes it's not. Sometimes we go for a walk and get some fresh air. Um, sometimes I'm still working, so I can't do any of those things. Um, but just sort of know that you have permission to do what is best for your child. Um, the graphic on the left of the screen um, might be questions that um, you could ask your kid, your child about um, as they're working on, on Dreambox. There's also a resource at the end of the presentation that has some other questions. Um, I know as, as I was in the classroom and trying to change my behavior or the way that I talk with kids, I always needed a cheat sheet. So we've provided a cheat sheet with, for you as well. Um, Another aspect of Dreambox that might be helpful for you um, is the family account. Um, so getting a family account allows you to have the same vantage point of the data that your child's teacher sees, but obviously only for your child. Um, so um, you would get to see growth and progress on um, the standards and how many lessons over time, things like that. Um, you also get emails. Um, uh, they're very detailed emails um, about what skills your child's working on, what the lesson was asking them to do. Um, sometimes those emails even help me better understand what was it in the lesson that was being asked. Um, and just sometimes that can help me have some confidence in what are some of the probing questions I might ask um, my daughter. Um, at the end of the presentation, um, there's a link for how to get a family account. Um, you need your child to be signed in on a computer. Um, it does not, the, the access to getting the family account the first time for just signing up, um, it doesn't become available if you're playing on an iPad. Um, also, um, in the student interface, they don't get to see the growth, the standards, how many lessons over time. Um, and so that can be something that might be really powerful to sit next to your child and look at together. Obviously, like you know your child best and if that's not, that's not where you're at, I would look at it maybe by yourself first. Um, but sitting down and looking at some of that and celebrating growth and perseverance um, can be pretty powerful. Sarah? Um, yeah. Um, I, I heard you say that um, on an iPad, you can't do that. Can you do that from a Chromebook? Yes. X okay. Yes. Um, so it just computer, laptop, Chromebook, um, just something about the, the app interface doesn't allow it. So it's only the first time. So the first time you get signed up, you put in your email address, you create a password. Um, and then after that, you can go into a separate website um, to log into your family dashboard. And even from there, your kid can log in as well. Um, and if you have more than one child, you can link so that you have a dashboard that has one username and one password and it, it shows all your kids if you have more than one um, child with an account. Um, so um, here's where I feel like I might blow your mind. <laughs> um, because Dreambox is fully adaptive and collects 800 pieces of data per minute, kids should not be using any tools other than the ones provided by Dreambox, meaning paper and pencil on the side, calculators, whiteboard, whiteboard app, any of the math that's done off the screen, it's impossible for Dreambox to know what were the strategies that your child used. Um, so that makes Dreambox quite a bit different than many of the other online tools that kids might be doing math with, um, um, hopefully not in our district, but that are available. Um, so we, we really need kids to be using the tool that is provided. So Dreambox, um, as long as Dreambox has had the ability to adapt to your child, um, is not going to show them something they haven't already demonstrated they can do with either the tool provided or mental math. Um, also remember that I'm not saying Dreambox is only gonna show your child something that's easy that they know immediately how to answer. So Dreambox was the program selected because it, it does create that productive struggle and it does sort of force your child 
to be in that problem solving mindset. And those are really good things for brain development and growth. Um, those wrong answers, gosh, celebrate the heck out of those high fives um, when you got it wrong, but you kept going. Um, I encourage kids all the time, like when you first get to a lesson, um, that next bullet says those directions are vague on purpose. Dreambox doesn't tell you exactly what to do. Um, they want you to be in that figure it out mindset. Um, and so sometimes that means that the first couple you get wrong because you don't even know what they were asking. And as you get them wrong, you can sort of start to connect some of the dots about, oh, that's what they're looking for. That's what they want instead. Um, one of the, the um, men that I deal with at, at Dreambox, who was our rep for a bit of time, said that you just need to think about Dreambox directions like Ikea directions, <laughs> if you've ever built an Ikea bunk bed or a dresser. Um, so we, we do want kids to be, um, be able to get things wrong and know that the system adapts and, and that developing that persevere muscle. Um, finishing lessons is really important. That's what gives Dreambox the, the richest data to be able to adapt to your child. Um, in the classroom, um, students often had to stop doing Dreambox mid-lesson because of time limitations, the schedule, it was time to go to recess or PE. Um, at home, maybe that's happening less often, maybe not. Um, if dinner is ready and on the table and the lesson isn't done, um, you gotta stop. Um, so reminding your child that they should be clicking the X in the top right corner of the screen to stop is really important, especially if they have, have put in a lot of um, perseverance and progress and effort into the lesson they're working on. Um, if we just walk away from Dreambox in the middle of a lesson, if we just swipe up on the iPad or close the tab, um, Dreambox says that they can't guarantee your progress is gonna be saved. And then it's possible students, after 10 minutes, students get completely logged out and then they would be starting from scratch, which can be really frustrating. Um, so making sure to click the X in the top right is super important. Um, and also, as I said, um, this is a program that's available all summer long. Um, so what we saw in the beginning in that tale of two students is that students can be working on multiple grade levels at a time. So because your child is done with kindergarten, that doesn't mean that they are done with lessons. Um, so they can continue working on kindergarten lessons over the summer. They can get work on first grade or if they get to second grade lessons. So um, having them continue to do Dreambox if, if you so choose. Um, also, we want to once it starts to be sunny outside, we can get outside and enjoy the fresh air as well. Um, so that kind of concludes um, what we were gonna cover today. Um, the link on the screen right now gives you the presentation that I just shared. Um, and then the, the links underneath that are some support resources. Um, so there's a newsletter that talks all about using Dreambox at home um, during school closures. Um, there's information on the district webpage about Dreambox, uh, and then also some login support, getting a family account, and then those questions, which is a little bit like a cheat sheet to ask your child while they're working in Dreambox if they are struggling or need your help. Um, for technical support, um, sometimes kids run into something that has maybe more to do with the device that they're using instead of their actual Dreambox account. Um, so I have a few tips on that page, um, but oftentimes that is going to require um, uh, contact with the teacher or the school office to put you in touch with the technology specialist there. Um, but um, if we have questions that didn't get answered or things that kind of came up a lot that I didn't talk about, um, we can definitely do that now. I'll let um, the other panelists kind of jump in if they if they feel like there's something that we, we want to go back over. They might be furiously typing answers to your questions. We are still <laughs> typing some answers to the questions. Um, I don't know. I wasn't, didn't have my ear on That's the okay. whole thing, Sarah, but I would, was wondering um, if you might talk a minute about um, how, how does Dreambox decide when it's time to let the student move forward within their lessons? Um, maybe you already addressed that a little bit, um, uh -huh. but thinking about like sometimes a kid will get the right answer and then you're like, wow, this didn't move forward like we thought it would. We're still working on it. If you could kind of address that a little bit. Oh, sure, sure. 
Um, so within each lesson, there's a um, like a small green bar and it goes along the bottom or the side, depending on what learning environment. And it sort of fills in as students get correct answers. Um, it is frustrating for students when they get a wrong answer and it goes backwards. Um, I've had talked with a lot of students about how they're making progress and they keep getting right answers, but it doesn't fill in or it gets really close and doesn't finish. Um, because Dreambox is recording so much data about what the student is doing, um, we, we oftentimes see where it might be a right answer, but Dreambox is waiting for you to use a different strategy or a more efficient strategy. Um, so an example of that, um, I've seen a lesson where there were like two buckets um, and each had a different number of balls in the bucket and you wanted to make friendly numbers, um, sort of round numbers. Um, and I could move eight from this bucket over here. I could move five from that bucket, like, but I could get, I could get a right answer, but it was sort of about what strategy I was using. And, and if you can think about it as in terms of um, how many moves is it taking you to get that answer? Um, that might be a way of, of sharing that information with your child. Like, is there a different way you could do it? Um, another reason sometimes that, that students who are giving right answers get in a lesson and kind of can't get out. Um, sometimes the lesson is the last lesson for that standard. Um, so there are several lessons for each standard. And if you're in the last lesson for the standard, it might be just asking for even more evidence that you definitely understand it before it's going to give the lesson closes and also gives your teacher the information um, that your child is proficient at that standard. Um, sometimes lessons close because you've gotten them wrong. Um, and so where we, we say wrong answers are definitely not bad, that is still the case. Um, so if a student gets um, several wrong answers in a row, sometimes they're given a hint. Um, sometimes the lesson adapts and becomes a little bit easier or a little bit more um, scaffolded with a little bit more support. Um, and, and sometimes even if that happens and you're still getting it wrong, um, the lesson will close. So that green bar fills in um, and the student does get credit for the lesson, but all of that data is recorded. And then the dashboard and the lessons that are available to your child will change. Um, so know that that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and time in Dreambox and lessons completed in Dreambox just sort of it gets it closer tuned um, to what your child needs. Hey, Sarah. Yeah. Um, there was a question about the change of environment. And so say you had a child who was in second grade, but completed all the second grade standards. Would their environment change or is that something that has to be changed? Great question. Um, so here's, here's what I'm told from Dreambox. What I'm told from Dreambox is that once a student um, unlocks a certain level of third grade math, so demonstrates proficiency at at least some of third grade math, they sort of automatically unlock. And I do know there's like a little celebration on the screen. Um, here's what I know in real time practice. Um, and what I've heard from students and parents and teachers and seen on my end of things is that sometimes it feels like this, the student has done enough third grade math, but they're still in the K2 environment. Um, that's a change that can be made by your child's classroom teacher. Um, just so that you know, um, some of the aspects, what you saw on the dashboard are a little bit different. So there isn't a house and an arcade, um, the money the aspect kind of changes. And so the math does not change at all. So again, it's like the chapter book, but with the Bob and Sue in, inside. Um, so nothing about the math is going to change if, you're, if the learning environment changes for your child. Um, they do lose their tokens um, if you were to request um, that, that their teacher change the learning environment. Um, so if you have a child who is sort of ready for the three, five environment, that would be something that, that you would contact the teacher about. Um, and then another question was, um, what happens if um, there's only like two icons available? So usually there's five, but there's only two or three. Why is that? Fantastic question. Um, so we didn't see it on the, on the ones that I showed you, um, but sometimes they'll be locked or um, 
in the so in the three five and the six eight environment they just show up with little lock symbols on them basically that's a little bit like the orange lessons in the k2 environment but they aren't allowed in so that just means that dreambox thinks this might be a next step for you but we don't have enough data yet so we need you to do the other lessons to show us either that you're ready for this or not ready and then we'll put, pull something else up um, in the K2 environment, it might look like there's there's only one circle to choose from, or there are fewer circles to choose from. Um, I've even seen I've even seen it where a child has avoided a lesson that they don't want to do for so long that there are only two lessons available, and they're both the same lesson. <laughs> Sometimes you just can't progress until Dreambox knows what you know about that thing, um, so that's why they're locked. Do you have any other questions from the chat? I'm sure they're furiously typing. Yeah, Sarah, I just wanted to add on. I think I've seen this in a couple of parent chats and it came up again today that, um, you know, obviously Dreambox isn't the only um, digital tool that is out there for math. And I know parents are kind of like, well, we're using this instead or we're using this instead and i guess i just kind of wanted to um reiterate why we're choosing to use dreambox um in bsd and and just so you know that um part of part of the reason why we're really encouraging parents to be using dreambox at home specifically is because of how well it ties into the curriculum rebecca was talking about that a little bit earlier it also really helps teachers to know where your child is and and um it's it's not always perfect because you're your teacher's gonna be looking at that and looking at classroom assessment and at um, tasks that they're doing in the classroom, but thinking through um, how, how it aligns, it's using very similar strategies. And we have played around with some other online um, tech sort of math tools. And we find that when we have played around with some of those, that they don't align strategy wise as well as Dreambox. And so, um, your kids may be doing some something else, um, but we would highly recommend that if they can at least try to get those five to 10 lessons done on Dreambox a week, it'll really help give that information to teachers. Um, especially since the kids have been out of school, it's gonna be so helpful when we're starting to think about next year, looking at some of that data to be able to provide math instruction to kind of keep going forward. So I just wanted to add that on too, Sarah. Yeah, thank you very much, very true. Okay, well, I just wanna say thank you very much um, for participating, asking great questions, which I'm sure I didn't get to see them in the chat, but I will look at them later. Um, and uh, we will go ahead and post the recording of, of today's webinar, as well as links to the presentation and some other information um, on the district website um, for you to access later.